So, good evening. It's marvelous to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Всем доброго вечера. Це дуже велика честь для мене бути тут. Дуже дякую за запрошення. And I, I came here for an academic conference, and then when I was told that there were all these people who were interested in Ebola, I thought it would be marvelous to meet them. Я приїхав сюди на конференцію, і коли я почув, що є певна кількість молодих людей, взагалі людей цікавлячися в творчості Евола, і мені здалося, що це було б непогано людей зустрітися з ними. And what I'm going to do is give you a version of what's actually an academic paper I gave in Germany. Um, but it's, it's trying to answer a question which is interesting for scholars and I think is also perhaps interesting for other people, which is what is the relationship between René Guénon and Julius Erdogan? І взагалі це дослідження дає нам відповідь на питання, скажімо так, на які цікавляться студенти, учні, але так само це може бути цікаво для людей, які цікавляться у взаємозв'язку між Евелом і Геном. Ah. There we are. Good. Okay. So Evola, here he is as a young man during the First World War. Вот вы тут можете видеть Юлиса Эвола, молодого человека в период Первой мировой войны. And then after the First World War, as you probably know, he tried a new career. И после Первой мировой войны, может вы знаете, он испробовал себе в новой карьере. As a painter. Як художник. And he's actually somebody who appears in books about the history of painting. І взагалі то це він належить до тих, які про яких були згадані в книжках про мистецтво, про малюнок. But what he's most famous for is not his painting. Але звісно він відомий, найбільше він відомий не за своїм картинами. In fact, he became famous four times. Фактично, він ставав відомим чотири рази. The first time. Перший раз. He became famous in the 1940s. Він став відомим в 1940-х. Because he especially interested this gentleman. Бо він був цікавився саме в цьому джентльмені. With his writings on race. З його написів. О, я думаю. Yeah, so his synthesis of the doctrine of race, yeah, in Italian. Then uh, he, he became famous again after the Second World War. Потім він став відомим другий раз після Другої світової війни. In the 1970s. 1970-х. As a writer who inspired writers in Italy. Який був письменником, який надихнув письменників Італії. And also as somebody who was read in France by thinkers of the French New Right, notably this gentleman here, Alain de Benoît. І так само він став відомий для тих для читачів Франції, because he was. For writer, for so he was famous in France for French readers. He was read. He was read by the French. Да, його читало у Франції. Who were developing the French new right thought. Який був відомий так, що він розвивав нову як нові правила. And then he became famous again. Потім він став відомий третій раз. When he also was. Interesting somebody else who you probably have heard of, Mr. Dugin. Yes. 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 And then he became famous yet again. For people who read the New York Times. Because 
President, the pre President uh, Trump's special advisor, Steve Bannon, made a reference to Evola. Тому що радник президента зробив which sent the American press to try and find out who is this Evola person. Anyhow, so that's Evola and how he became famous four times. That one is quite easy. The question is, what is the relationship between Evola and René Guénon. Це буде легко. І питання, що яка, скажімо так, що є спільного між Евою і Рене Гіно? Who we see here in this photograph in Cairo in the late 1940s. Якого ми можемо спостерігати на на фотокартці в Каїрі в на в пісні 1940-х. And that's what I'm going to talk about now this evening. І це те, про що я хотів би сьогодні розповісти сьогодні вечором. Є два погляди стосовно цього. One view famously is in this book The Morning of the Magicians. перший погляд ми можемо спостерігати в цьому виданні, яка називається Ранок Магії. Ранок Магії, which was extremely famous throughout Western Europe in the 1960s. Яка була неймовірно відома в Західній Європі в період 1960-х. In which the authors say that Hitlerism was Genonianism plus armed divisions. В які застерігали, що в які було ці пірати було зазначено, що гітлеризм був генонським як плюс This is a reference to uh, somebody else who said that communism was socialism plus electrification. <laughs> <laughs> you think you know who I'm referring to. Now. Okay. So this is one idea that Hitlerism was Genonians plus armed division. The opposite view is taken by these guys, who are French scholars. And they say the opposite. These are the French experts on Geno. He says that you cannot read Geno politically. He says that Genon never wrote a properly political book. And he says that uh, well, he says something quite complicated. We'll come to that later. So that's the question. What's the relationship between them? And I'm going to argue that no, neither of those are right. І я готовий подискусувати в тому, що ніхто з них не має не має раті. Hitler never even heard of Gehen. Гітлер ніколи навіть не чув про Гена. Rosenberg, on the other hand, did. З іншого боку, Розенберг чув. As far as, as far as, yeah, oops. As far as these guys are concerned, Jean-Pierre Laurent says that you cannot read Guénon politically. But many people do read him politically. He says that Guénon never wrote a political book. 
Он первый раз сказал, что я никогда не написал политическую книжку об политической силе. Но он написал книжку «Спиритуальная власть» и «Темпоральная сила». And in my understanding, questions uh, of power. And in my understanding, in my understanding, it's a question of power. Questions about power are political. In the questions of power, it's all about power. It's all about power. It's all about power. So, my argument is that these two are actually quite similar. Отже, моя позиція в тому, що ці два джентльмени мають в щось подібне розподіляти. Евел був більше зацікавлений в політичних питаннях, але так само і в духовних. Генон, на відміну, був також цікавився більше в духовних питаннях, але так само і, власне, цікавився політичним аспектом. Було три речі стосовно думки Генона. Which appeared to be non-political, but actually were quite political. Які були виявилися не політичними, але все таки мали свій політичний характер. The first of them was the condemnation of modernity. Перша з них була засудження сучасності. The second one was the expectation of an apocalypse. And the third one was Genon's idea about an intellectual elite. And this is a bit complicated because when Genon says intellectual, he means spiritual. І це було трошечки, власне, складно, тому що коли Генон зазначав інтелект, інтелектуально він мав на увазі і духовно. So, let's look at these ideas. Отже, давайте подивимось на ці ідеї. And let's also look at Genon's fourth big idea. І давайте також споглянемо на Генон's четверту велику ідею. Which is the idea of perennialism. І яка є ідея перенеалізму? Перенеалізму. Perennialism is not political. Perennialism is not political. There have been many people who have been perennialists going back here to Stoico in 1542 who were not in any way involved in politics. There were many perennialists of perennialism, but they were far from the political side. They were from the Stoics in 1500s. These ideas, these three ideas, which are apparently non-political but are actually political, go right back to the beginning of the young Genon's work. These three ideas, which were not only political in nature, but were also related to politics, they, as we can say, are related to the beginning of the young Genon's work. One of the first things that Genon wrote. One of the first things that he wrote. One of the first things that he wrote was that the group that he belonged to was attached to traditions is much older than all the religions and it is nowhere obliged to adjust itself to the requirements of the special mentality of each country. Okay, it was... So should we do it easily? Because it's, it's, it's here. Okay. So it's attached to a tradition that's older than religion. Хідності специфічного менталітету певного сторіччя та певної країни. Мало адаптуватися. Мало адаптуватися. 
Ми віримо в те, що правда не може бути не може бути зроблена доступною масами без страждання та зазнавання якихось потворення. Тобто без потворення. І ми вважаємо, що вона була... Святотавство зменшувати, редукувати доктрину до рівня вульгарних розробів. Умів. So this is getting on writing right at the beginning in 1910, before the First World War. Це було перше одне запис Абінона, який він зробив в 1910 році, прямо перед війною. And we have the idea of tradition. І ми маємо ідею про традицію. We have the idea that there is a doctrine which ordinary people are never going to be able to understand. І у нас є думка ідея про те, що доктрина і ніколи не буде мати змоги бути зрозуміли. And we have the we have the the anti-modernism, the idea that the mentality of this century. У нас є думка про антимодерність, про що як ментальний саме певний його сторіця. Is 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 not something to be very excited about. І це не те, що треба бути зацікавлено. He develops the ideas further in his early books. Він розвинув свої ідеї далі в своїх своїх перших книжках. Especially here in his general introduction to Hindu doctrines. So, in the books, the general step to learning Hindu. And then also in in his other later books. And then also in his other later books. Especially his book about the crisis of the modern world. So, in his book, the crisis of the modern world. Um, so these these are his apparently non-political ideas, and they have they have major political implications. It's a very non-political idea, but it has major political implications. And one of the first people to point this out. And one of the first people to point this out was the Italian writer Umberto Eco, who said that certain ideas were ideas which what, which around which they could gather what he called or fascism. By which he, by which he means really, he means right wing thought. And he lists, he lists thirteen points, and the first one of which is the cult of tradition. Він перечислює чотирнадцять позицій думок, і перший з яких позицій була культ традиції. The second one is rejecting modernism. Друга була це відмова від модернізму. And the third is the cult of action. І третє це культ ді. And I agree with Umberto Eco. Umberto Eco is referring here to Evola and to Geno. І я погоджуюсь, що Umberto Eco, адже він посилається так на and Eco, Eco, Umberto Eco thinks that these ideas of Gaynons have strong political force and ivory. And Umberto Eco thinks that the Gaynons have a strong political text and I agree with that. So, let's move on now. Okay, actually before we move on, somebody else who agreed with Umberto Eco was this guy Leon Dodi who was one of the leaders of a French group called Action Francaise, French Action. Uh, which was 
um, a, a major prominent French far right organization between the two wars. Яка була одна з головних основних організацій And uh, Dodi was very enthusiastic about Gaynor's work. Because he saw these political implications. Now let's move on. To now let's leave that one. Let's now move on to the explicitly political. We've got that. we've looked at ideas of Gaynor's which seem not to be political. Now let's look at the ideas which are political. And to do this, we need to look at two texts, two very political texts, which Gaynor did write. І для цього давайте споглянемо на два тексти, на дві роботи, які мали дуже сильно політичний текст. The first one was, was published in 1927. було році. And was called The King of the World. І називалося Король світу. And the other one is the year later, and it's the same one we've seen before, Spiritual Authority and Temple. So, we will start with this one, the King of the World. In this one, Geno is discussing the possibility that there is a secret, hidden power, central power. У ній Генон зазначає, що можливість існування спеціальної прихованої And this book is based on two other books. It's discussing two other books written by two other people. І ця книжка базується на двох інших книжках. Which are um, sort of travel, semi-travel, semi-fantasy. About a, a hidden kingdom in Tibet. <coughs> Geno takes these ideas and from these ideas gets into a discussion about the relation between spiritual authority and temporal authority. He also has some discussion of the idea of caste. Не також мов дискусію щодо And these he, these ideas they're there but they're not fully developed yet. він зазначав ці ідеї там, але вони не були в повній мірі розвинуті. He develops the ideas. Він розвинув ці ідеї у in this book. And in this book he argues у цій книжці він Дискусує, сперечається, що означає. That originally, що початково, the supreme authority was spiritual authority. Вища влада була духовною владою. And that was in, in charge, in command of temporal power. І це було в силі, домінувало над he then, he then develops this in terms of the idea of the four castes. The, the Brahmin caste of the priests. The Kshatriya caste of the warriors. The Vaisha caste of the 
and finally the Shudra caste of the laborers. And he argues that human society was originally structured in these on the basis of these four castes. І він зазначав, що людська суспільство була базована на прикладі цих чотирьох каст, структуровано. With the spiritual authority here being in charge of temporal power. Що духовна влада була над мистецькою. And temporal power being in charge of the bourgeoisie. Мистецька влада волувала, домінувала над буржуазією. And then the laborers at the bottom. And he he then connects this with the French idea of the four estates. And in 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 medieval France they had a system of four estates whereby on top was the church. І в середньовічній Франції була така ж сама думка структурування суспільства, що де зверху буде верховенство була церква. А там underneath was the nobility. Знати. Буржуазія. Буржуазія. Сабс. And what has gone wrong? І що що було не так, що пішло не так? Is that first the warriors revolt against the priests. And then, and then the bourgeoisie revolts against the nobility. And then the serfs revolts against the bourgeoisie. And who started this? King Philip IV. From the 13th century, because he enlisted the help of the bourgeoisie in his fight with the nobility. And since then, things have only got worse. As he says. The revolt of the Kshatriyas leads to heterodoxy. But the domination of lower castes is intellectual night. And that is how things are today in the West, which is threatening to spread its own shade over the whole world. For these purposes, you regard the Soviet Union as being part of the West. So, that's political. What then, what is the impact of this thought on Evola? I hope I've convinced you that Genon does have political thoughts. Yeah. So, what does this do to Evola? Right. It is important that some people, that their spiritual or political awakening happens when they first read Genon. Дуже важливо, що для деяких людей відчувають духовне пробудження, коли ми читаємо Генона. This did not happen to Evola. Це не сталося у випадку з Генона. Evola had already started reading and thinking and writing before he ever encountered Genon. Evola почав писати, думати, свої думки висловлювати до того, як він прочитав, спіткнувся з Геноном. One of the biographers of Evola distinguishes two periods in his life, a philosophical period and a magical period. <coughs> Evola had completed his philosophical period where his most important reading is Nietzsche before he came across 
філософський любов вже провинувся на більший період, частиною якої головною був Ніцше, до того, як він зіткнувся з геномом. Here, okay, here are the uh, here are the people he was reading in the philosophical period. Nietzsche, Fichte, Weininger, Michelstetter. And he'd already read all these guys and formed his own views on the basis of these guys before he ever came across uh, Gino. And he'd written and published two of his most important books already. One of them is the theory of the absolute individual. And the other one is his essays on magic idealism, which draws on uh, Novalis. It's important to understand here what Evelyn means by magic. And I don't know how this is going to work in translation because we're going to have to use German now. Novalis distinguishes two sorts of truth. Which of course in German is Wahrheit. So he has what he calls natural which are the ones that we can understand rationally and test in the laboratory. And wonder wahrheit, wonder. Truth, which we cannot test in the laboratory. And, and when Evola says magic, he's using magic in the sense of wunderbarheit. So we already have some of Evola's most important ideas before he's even read Vietnam. But then he does read Genon. And he reads Genon in the period of his life when he's part of something <coughs> called the Ur group. And it's called the Ur group because they publish a journal called Ur. This is its first year of publication and it says underneath, it says Review of Esoteric Sciences. I don't have a photograph of the second year, but in the second year this, this subtitle disappears and the word tradition appears here instead. <laughs> the Ur group is, is publishing this journal, but also it is doing magical exercises to achieve trans contact with the transcendent. And this is the point when Evola gets interested in Vietnam. This is the period when Evola writes his book about pagan imperialism. And this is the point when suddenly Evola is getting interested in for himself for the first time. Because until now Evola was interested in painting, he was interested in philosophy, and he was interested in the transcendent. And 
And now he gets interested in politics because he is trying to, with this book, he is trying to convince the fascists that they not only have to restore, restore the Roman Empire, but they have to restore Roman religion. He then gets even more interested in politics. He publishes a new journal which is aimed at the spiritual renewal of the Italian people. And then he starts writing a column in a newspaper called The Fascist Regime. And this, this, isn't, uh, this is newspaper is not aimed at, at, at philosophers, it's aimed at people in the streets who are buying newspapers. And Everless column in this newspaper has the marvelous title. Marvelous title of Spiritual Problems in Fascist Ethics. <laughs> Which is a pretty good title, you're great, yeah. Okay, so. Evola, without getting on philosophy. Evola, with philosophy. Evola, with getting on politics. Evola, with getting on politics. But also, oops, I can't put them out. Okay, sorry, I have to go back. I have to go back. We're going too far. Help. No, it's not meant to translate. <coughs> okay, so what has he taken? What has he taken from Vienna? He's taken the idea of the perennial tradition. He's taken the idea of anti-modernism. He's taken the idea of caste regression. That's when the wrong caste takes over from the other caste. And he's also taken Gaynor's idea of an intellectual elite. If we look at what is probably his most famous book, Revolt Against the Modern World, now available in Ukraine, the revolt bit is definitely ever that. And that goes back to Nietzsche and, and, and everybody you like. The against the modern world bit, that is good. <coughs> this is a quotation from Orientamenti, guidelines written in 1950, one of, of Evola's latest works. And here, if we read this, we see that Geno's ideas are very present in this very famous text of Evola's. So, now we it's, it's use, okay. It's, it's a... So, at the cycle, when you say at the end of a cycle, this is Gaynor's idea of cyclical time which is taken from him. The idea about the legitimate order among men, this is caste, this is regression of caste. Mm -hmm. 
and the idea about the change, which is called progress. This is this is given as anti-modernism. So what we find is that there are some ideas which are just ever like the idea of the absolute individual. And then there are actually two ideas that Evola disagrees with Genoa on. One of them is they have a slight disagreement about castes. Because Genoa says that the priestly caste should rule over the warrior caste. Whereas Evola says that the warrior caste also has spiritual authority. Geno says that it's important to be initiated into a, an esoteric religious practice. Evola says this might be true in the East, but in the West what matters is action. So although there's a lot of agreement, there are these two little points of disagreement. This is where we get to what Akal says, the third French scholar I'm disagreeing with. He says that the reason that, Gen that Evola got involved with politics had nothing to do with him. He points to these disagreements, the disagreement about spiritual authority, the, dif the difference of views on spiritual transmission, on initiation, and he says that the reason that Evola got into politics was because of the disagreements with Gain, not, not the agreements with Gain. I say certainly these disagreements existed, but that's not the only reason why Evola got into politics. He was living in Italy, in fascist Italy. If you get interested in politics in Italy at this point, what sort of politics are you going to get interested in? <laughs> but also beyond that, we've got the importance of the ideas that he took from Gemma. Also, we have the question not just of why did Evola get into politics in the 1930s, but what do people find in Evola's politics today? And as we see, people are very interested in Evola's politics today all over the place. <coughs> and one of these books is available next door. <laughs> my, my, my argument is that today, when people are reading Evola, a lot of what they are reading through Evola comes from Gaynor. 
Багато що вони читають сповз, а вони запозичують. Походить від мінулого. И давайте перейдем до наших финальных выступлений. Which is that it's not true. Які поливають у тому, що це неправда, що that Hitlerism was gain on plus tanks. Що Гітлерізм був gain on plus tanks, від різні plus tanks. And it is not true that gain on never wrote anything political. І так само не неправда, що він не ніколи не писав нічого політичного. That the truth lies between the two. That although Evola got some of his most important ideas before he read Geno, Evola's complete ideas wouldn't have been possible without Geno. So, if you're not convinced, you can ask me some questions. Or I ask me some questions anyhow. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. So, I understood that was a vegetarian. I really don't. I have never heard that. What's What's your what's your source? <laughs> Just out of interest. Uh, because um, I know that many many uh, a lot of people wish interesting in some Indian uh, uh, yeah. Saint uh, Saint writing they are uh, almost uh, veg vegetarian. Yeah. Um, you can translate the question. Uh, like, do you guys, uh, I haven't heard that. Well, the only religious practice that I've heard of about Geno is that when he was a young man in Paris, he was interested in all sorts of esoteric and Masonic practices. And after he moved to Egypt in 1930, he had the idea that you had to follow an esoteric path within an exoteric context. And that his esoteric practice was Sufism, and his exoteric practice was Islam. And Islam doesn't oblige you to eat meat, but people do. Yeah. Uh, what you can say about uh, uh, René Guénon and the Sufism? What about uh, um, uh, how... What the connection was? Connection, connection, connection. Okay, the, the connection is that Guénon Genov is always interested in two things. He's interested in the ideas and he's interested in the practice. So, when he starts off, his ideas are fairly consistent. From 1910 until 1950, his ideas develop, but they don't change radically. His practice does change, however. Because the practices that he starts off with in 1910, which are connected to what he calls the Gnostic Church, he decides these are complete rubbish and drops them. And then he seems to do nothing for a few years, and then when he gets to Egypt and discovers Sufis in Egypt, he joins them and follows their practice. 
І здавалося, що впродовж цих пару років він не робив майже нічого, але потім він приїхав в Єгипет, і там він знав практику суфізму. Зацікавився. And then, of course, this is the next question that comes along, is so why doesn't Avila become a Sufi? <laughs> and people ask him this question. I mean, I've, I've met somebody who met Avila and asked him this question, why don't you become a Sufi? <laughs> to which Avila's answer was this disagreement about initiation. He said, that may be true for you in the East, but for us in the West, action is the way, not initiation. Uh, would he influence on uh, political uh, circles in Italy or for Germany, in your opinion? No, I think, I think Guénon never shows any real signs of being interested in actual current political questions. When Action Francaise said that he was a marvelous guy, he said in a letter to a friend, this is nice, I've never even met him. Right? But he didn't then write to Action Francaise and say, great, let's work together. When, when he wrote uh, his book about spiritual authority, he actually says in the beginning that you might think this has got to do with some discussions that are going on at present, because the Pope had just condemned Action Francaise. Actually, it's got nothing to do with this. I was going to write this book anyhow. So, generally, Guénon just refuses to get involved in, in current political questions, whereas Evola is always very keen to get involved in current political questions, which is why he gets involved with, he gets involved with fascism, he gets involved with the Nazis, he gets involved in, any, you know, anything Evola will, will try, right? He has many tries. Yeah, he has many tries. And he's still at <laughs> beyond the grave. Чи правда, що Юліус Евола заборонив подальше переведення своєї книги язичницький імперіалізм? І якщо так, то з якої причини? Is it true that Evola forbade further publishing, republishing of his Hedon imperialism? And if it's true, why? Okay, I don't know whether it's true or not. I can guess why. Я не знаю, чи це є правдою чи ні, але я в мене є певні думки, що стосовно цього, що це правда. And that is that he rewrote pagan imperialism for an audience in Nazi Germany. Це те, що він перенаписав свою фразу язичницький імперіалізм для нацистської нації. And of course he, because Evler is always happy to get involved in any political question, because the Nazis were fascinated by race. <laughs> Evler adds discussions of race for the German edition of Pagan Imperialism. <laughs> After the end of the Second World War, it's embarrassing. <laughs> that would be my guess. There are two versions. Uh, the first, uh, which was uh, written in Italy, and the second version. Correct. Corrected for German, yes? Correct. Thank you. Yeah, and you can compare them. The German version is longer and it has extra material. Thank you. What is your several point of view on uh, Orthodox Church? Because we know about yeah. this uh, serious skepticism about Christianity, but uh, mostly it was about uh, Catholicism and Protestantism. Yeah. Yeah. What about Orthodoxy? 
he, it wasn't a question that seemed very important to him. He's, he's opposed to the Catholic Church because, apart from anything else, he's an Italian nationalist. And Italian nationalism, if you think back to the 19th century, <coughs> when Italian nationalists are trying to unify Italy, the, the Pope is not very keen on the reunification of Italy. So, in the 19th century, if you're a nationalist, you're going to be anti-Catholic. So, he's, he's anti-Catholic because he's a nationalist, and he's also anti-Catholic because he's following Nietzsche's views and, and so on. Like that. Yeah. But orthodoxy, I don't, think he, I don't think he ever came across orthodoxy. So, it's a, it's a good question. What would he have thought of orthodoxy if somebody had explained it to him? Uh, is this really necessary to talk about to understand the connection between Evel and Gideon? Regini certainly provides the connection. I think you can get the basic idea without bringing in Regini. Right? If you want to understand it in all its details, you have to bring in Regini. And you have to read Christian Judice's book, I yeah, which is coming out. Yes, good. Okay, um, but I think you can get the big idea with. I mean, it's a great, it's a great work that, and I'm really glad to find somebody here who knows about it. Um, but I think you can get the big idea without reading. Really. What was the position of Ebola on the failure of the fascism? I'd love to be asked this question by an Italian. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you will like the reply. Ebola said, some people say that fascism ruined Italy. I say that Italy ruined fascism. <laughs> 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 I mean, Evola was never Mussolini's biggest fan. He criticized Mussolini for being too bourgeois, for cooperating with the church, for not being sufficiently absolute, for all sorts of things. So he was never Mussolini's greatest fan. He was prepared to work with him when he thought that that would achieve something, but he never joined the fascist party, you know, so not his problem. За філософією Еволи, як співвідносились касти жерців і воїнів? Якщо у Генона було чітке підпорядкування, то як саме взаємодіяли і розмежовувалися жерці і воїни за Еволою? According to Evola, uh, what was uh, the, uh, what was the relation between the case of uh, uh, priests, warriors, and warriors, because uh, according to Genon, uh, uh, priests dominate over warriors, and uh, well, how did you solve? Right. So, Genon and Evola agree that originally the two forms of authority, that of the warrior and that of the priest, or or the the, the spiritual and the temporal, were one. So they both agreed that originally they are one. <laughs> the question then, the question then is, and they both agree that they separate. But the question then is, what is what, what do they have with them after they separate? So. Обидва погоджуються в тому, що вони були ці дві касти були розділені, але питання було, що який момент часу, бо знаєш, вони були одним, і вони обидва з цим погоджувалися, що була єдність початково сакральної і світської влади, духовної і мирської. So for 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 Geno, once they've separated, the only one he's interested in is the spiritual authority, which in practice means Sufis. But for Evola, it's the warrior who has the spiritual preparation. Right? 
There's one point. There's one point at which Evola says that if somebody goes off and fights without have without the necessary preparation, they're wasting their time. But for everyone, when you combine act, you combine the right sort of action and the right sort of of of, of, of preparation, that you can get something. Was Ebola um, a member of any political, at least circle, or he was purely theoretical? He he was a member. Originally, he was a member of a spiritual circle, the order. He never belonged to a formal political party or anything of that sort. However, he did engage in political action. So he engaged in political action not as a member of the, of the fascist party, but as the guy who was helping Mussolini develop an, Itali an alternative Italian understanding of race. What he was doing in 1945, we don't really know, but we do know that he was in Vienna with the SS. What he was doing there, we don't know. But if you are in Vienna with the SS in 1945, you, you're not just theoretical. You know, you're, you're up to something. Although what it was, we don't know. They didn't, I mean, they, they didn't know that much about it, but as far as Guinan was concerned, the Soviet Union was the final stage in the regression of the cards. We're not translating that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's like orthodoxy. He was sitting in Paris and then he went to Cairo. You know, and, and how, how many Russian Orthodox, well, you find a few Greek Orthodox in Cairo, but I, you know, he, he was hanging out with Sufis, right? So these weren't questions that occupied him. Uh, if uh, someone from Trump's administration quoted Evola, can we say that uh, he's popular in Trump's uh, circles? <laughs> Trump's, Trump's circles are, are not homogenous. Yeah? I mean, I'm not an expert on American politics. Your opinion. Yeah, but as far as I can see, Trump is Trump. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are some hard-headed practical guys who've, you know, come up through the army and the government and stuff. And then there are some intellectuals. And the main intellectual is Bannon. And Bannon has not only referred to Avala, but he's told somebody, and this, you can't tell anybody this until next month. It's going to be published sometime this month, the book in which uh, Steve Bannon is quoted as saying that reading Gaynor changed his life. But what, what they think in the Pentagon about this, you know, <laughs> <laughs> In the Pentagon, they're all googling again on to find out who is this guy. <laughs> what is the connection between Ebola and Dugin, actually? <laughs> <laughs> you should be able to tell me that. <laughs> I think, I mean, for me, I think the connection is that uh, just like reading Guénon changed Bannon's life, reading Evola changed Dukin's life. Uh, 
right? Um, I mean, from everything we know about Dugin as a young man, reading Avila was extremely important to his early intellectual orientation and development. Now, Dugin has moved, Dugin started off as a theoretician. He started off in a place just like this with a load of books. And then he moved more and more into practical politics. And the more you move into practical politics, the more the practical matters and the less your original theories matter, in general, I think. And I think that may be what has happened to you. But you probably know more about him than I do. I only have heard that uh, Dugin more uh, was influenced and by um, Lev Gumilov, uh, historical yeah. and uh, uh, father of Russian Eurasian uh, movement, but uh, not uh, his. Do, 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 do he's been influenced by Evola, he's been, he's been influenced by Gumilov, he's been influenced by Heidegger, he's been influenced by De Benoit. You know, Dugin, Dugin reads everything. <laughs> <laughs> So do you agree that his attempts to combine Revola the non-orthodoxy and pagan imperialism and sometimes even Thilema and do the It's amazing. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, eclectic is the right word. Yes. Eclectic is the right word. Yeah. Dark waters. <laughs> In terms of his, one of his latest issues. Duration is true. So... How would you explain the fact that uh, although Evola gets increasingly popular uh, in the post war period, popular than more popular than ever before, he uh, uh, refuses from the moment into politics and puts forward the concept of authority? I think he's going back to his earlier approach. Because if you think of if you think of Evola's period, he starts off in his philosophical period, and then his magical period is an attempt to make the philosophical period real. Many philosophers are discussing the relationship between us and the transcendent, and then they just go home. Evola, the young Evola isn't interested in only discussions about this, he wants to make it real, he wants to experience it. So originally Evola is, not, is interested in the individual and individual action and the absolute individual, the title of his first book. Then, actually years after the fascists have taken over in Italy, he gets involved in practical politics and he, you know, he, he writes in the regime newspapers and he talks Muslims. And then it all collapses. The Italians ruin it. It all collapses. So then he goes back to his earlier position and he's interested again in the absolute individual. And this is this is part of the point of our polite, right? That that if according to the idea of our polite, I'm not meant to sit there and check the opinion polls and, and see which party is going to win which election and, and try and, and do things at that level. According to that idea, I'm back to the idea of the absolute individual and myself and what I should achieve and how I can achieve it through action and, 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 and so forth. So I think it's, it's, it's not that after the war he changes, it's that he changes <coughs> during the war and then after the war he goes back to his original position. Yeah, <laughs>
Ви згадали про вплив Наваліса на раннього Еволу. Чи взагалі можна провести якісь паралелі або порівнювати традиціоналізм Гнона і Еволи з консервативним романтизмом початку XIX століття в Німеччині або в Франції авторами, які теж називають традиціоналістами, до речі? Хоча і шлю, значить impact of uh, Novalis on the young Ebola. Uh, is it possible to find the connection and influence uh, between the uh, German or French romantics of the early 19th century and their impact on the Ganon connection? Like Ganon Ebola, they also sometimes call traditions. Mm -hmm. uh, in a I think probably with Ebola it is possible because Avila was clearly interested in philosophy and, and, to, and to, he almost became an academic philosopher. So he certainly read these guys. So I'm sure you could demonstrate that. Genon was less interested in philosophy and once he had changed, once he'd adopted his later views about the perennial tradition and so forth, he really seems to have stopped reading modern philosophy except to condemn it. And also, Guénard is not good at giving his sources. Yeah. Evola is still, he's better at the beginning, but he, he's, Evola is happy to say where he's getting an idea from, so you can trace his intellectual development, my point is. Guénard just announces what is truth. Yeah. So to try and find out where he's getting the ideas from is, is very good. So I think the answer is it's much easier to do it with Evola than it is with Guénard. Uh, did have uh, did have uh, the Genon some uh, uh, connected uh, some relations with another French philosophy, Louis Massignon? <coughs> Complicated. Uh, Massignon certainly knows of Genon and. There is definitely, you, they're, they are definitely operating in the same world. They're, they're thinking along similar lines. Massignon is, however, <coughs> Massignon is aware of Guénon, but the relationship between Massignon and Guénon is not, you know, one simple one-to-one. -one. It's there, there are common influences, and Guénon to some extent influences Massignon, but, but they're, quite dis they're quite different in many ways. But the next question is Corbin, right? Yeah, because then we've got the same, we've got the same phenomenon with Corbin, that there is this distant influence. Can you please uh, clarify the um, attitude of Guénon towards Freemasonry? Uh, as I understood, he was a Freemason and then, uh, or did he disappoint in Freemasonry or was he supporting it uh, until his death? Guénon was very critical of certain varieties of Freemasonry, but he thought that other varieties of Freemasonry offered the closest you could get to an esoteric practice in the West. So he always remained optimistic about the possibilities of Freemasonry until his death. Once he was living in Cairo, when people wrote to him and said, I've read all your books, I now want to find a personal esoteric practice, his standard reply was, Try Freemasonry, and if that doesn't work, try Sufism. <laughs> Did women uh, write to him about such questions? <laughs> he was married. <laughs> <laughs> His wife intercepted them. <laughs> It's, it's, a very, it's a very interesting question, the question of traditionalism and gender. Yeah? And, I mean, there are not very many female traditionalists. 
when we are thinking about Evola's conception of the spiritual warrior, you can understand why that tends to be mad. Why Guénon's traditionalism tends to be male is very difficult to explain because there's no sort of logic, you know, you can say warrior male, that's easy, right? Islam is not Muslim. Well, half of Muslims are women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean spiritual practice, deep spiritual practice, are they yeah. yes. easy? Yes. Easily accepted then? Yes. Yes. I mean, you know, women, women don't, women don't go have to go to the mosque on Friday and listen to the sermon. But you know, do you like listening to sermons? I don't know. I mean, many people, many people would prefer to be not to have. No, I mean there is, you know, there there are female sufis. So what? Why not? Why not female female traditional sufis? He has the answer. Only when I'm off duty. <laughs> That's what the English police can say. If you offer them a drink, they say only when I'm off duty. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the idea of uh, dominance of uh, spiritual uh, experience over uh, rational learning, uh, uh, it, uh, in Western tradition it derives probably from uh, Neoplatonic circles, from Plotin, and so psychics and pneumatics, uh, and uh, does uh, uh, is it possible to trace this idea in Genon's uh, uh, from this very source, or he knew something but then reject or like, what actual relationship and connection? This is this is a very important question and a very difficult question. Because, on the one hand, Guénon is very critical of Neoplatonism and, and, of Greek, and of Greek philosophy. On the other hand, a lot of his ideas are, in my view, com very easily compatible with Neoplatonism. So, what is going on here? You know, he's criticizing it, but agreeing with it. Uh, so, I mean, this is, this is for me, uh, I, I, don't, I don't really know what's going on there. I mean, to what extent, to what extent Gaynon is, a, is, a, is, to what extent Gaynon is actually a Neoplatonist? Yeah. I mean, if, if you said to Gaynon, excuse me, monsieur, are you a Neoplatonist? You would say, absolutely not, ridiculous idea. Yeah. But whether, not, so many people are actually, even if they don't realize it, on the old place, and this without realizing this. And I think this may, you know, I think given might be in the old place without realizing it as well. In your book, we can uh, read about uh, Prince Charles' tradition, yes. traditionalism also. And um, uh, which, <coughs> sorry, uh, has British society a point of view on the traditionalism? Are they uh, looking at the map, no. I think I think most people in Britain have never heard of traditionalism. Um, there is there is this strange connection that you notice between traditionalism and royalty and aristocracy. 
And I'm not sure how we explain it. Do we explain it in the idea of car in terms of the idea of castes? If I am if I am a serf and I read about the regression of castes, I think great, that's what I want. Whereas if I'm if I'm a, a, an aristocratic warrior and I read the regression of uh, the regression of castes, I say yeah, that's exactly the problem. That's what I've been saying all the time. Um, it can go the other way around as well because a lot of the Sufi <coughs> tradition. Uh, have quite close relationships with political power. And is this because being anti-modern they tend to be a bit sort of anti-democratic and stuff? Or is it because they actually have a respect for temporal authority with spiritual power? And I, I really don't know the answer to that. But you can find this, you can certainly find this pattern. Of course, <coughs> in the end, Prince Charles does not, is not going to rule Britain. Yes. Um, and the Shah of Iran had a problem with the revolution. So really all we're left with is the Jordanian royal family, where there are some traditionalists in the Jordanian royal family, and they're still running Jordan. А через глядав Генон з точки зору традиціоналізму, відмінності між шиїзмом і сунізмом, як він на цей поділ ісламі дивився, якщо він взагалі ходив, це розглядав. Він не розглядав not that I have seen. Yeah. Um, I mean, he may have done somewhere, but I haven't noticed this. And, you know, I think it's a bit like orthodoxy. You know, why, why is he's, he is the Islam that he knows is Sunni Islam. Right? Uh, he's in Cairo, the text he's reading, his informants, they're all about Sunni Islam. I'm sure he knew that there was another version of Shia Islam over there, but, you know, it's not the one in front of him. Uh, when Gennon became uh, the Sufi, did he reject, uh, just abandon his ideas uh, that he uh, um, declared in uh, his books in French period? Or he still uh, had used them and combined them with his new Sufi view. Yeah. He, he combined them. He combined them because for 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 Gino, there's two there's two questions. One of them is how do we understand things, mm -hmm. and the other is what do we now do about it. And the he never changed his mind that much about how do we understand. If you say to, if you take a normal Egyptian Sufi and say, excuse me, why are you doing what you're doing? They will reply in terms of Islam and the Quran and stuff like that. If you ask him on why he was doing what he was doing, he'd respond in terms of Vedanta and cyclical time and stuff. And your normal Egyptian Sufi would look very confused at this point. Yeah? But he, he, he never, he, he didn't, he developed these ideas and he didn't fundamentally change them. Uh, so uh, the uh, idea, the dream, the crime, uh, that uh, used by Genon uh, lineage in Sufism is actually combined the ideas of Sufism and the Genon early idea. Yeah. Yeah. No, yes, I mean, because as far as Gennon was concerned, Sufism has two things. It has ideas and it has practices, right? And some, I mean, some people, including some later traditionalists, have taken their ideas very strongly from Sufism and their practice has been Sufi. Gennon never took that many ideas from Sufism. There are references to Sufism, there are references to Islam, but it's not the main source of his ideas. It was never the main source of his ideas. 
So, I mean, he was, he was in his later years, he was following a practice which apparently had nothing to do with his ideas, right? But actually, in his understanding, that's not how it was, because in his understanding, it's all one. That's the whole point about the perennial philosophy. What Islam is saying, what Hinduism is saying, what anything valuable in the Greeks is saying, let's consider the Buddhists or whatever, to the extent it's valuable, it is the same thing. So, once you understand it as being the same thing, this is why he said it's impossible to convert. Because if you understand the perennial philosophy, you can't convert. Uh, and he said that he'd never converted to Islam, he said he'd moved into Islam. Yeah? Like, I'm going to move into a different hotel room tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> Which shocked some people, you know, they, they had some of the French priests especially, when they heard about this guy saying, you, you just move into another religion, my God, what is this? But that, that's what it was, well, that's how it was again, no contradiction. Yeah. So what about leaving Islam? Uh, for example, you can be converted into Islam, but about uh, leaving the Islam well, for that's another religion? That's exactly what one of the French priests said, you know. There's, he said, this guy's got the idea that you just follow the, whatever religion happens to be convenient to you at this particular moment. So today you're a Muslim and tomorrow you're going to be a Hindu. And what are you going to be on Thursday? Right? But, you know, as far as Gienon was concerned, it's all the same thing. Right? Theoretically, if Gienon had moved to Japan... <laughs> I don't know what he'd have done when he got to Japan. But, you know, any, I mean, theoretically, he stayed in Japan. Uh, what were relations between Julius Evola and philosophers of uh, German conservative revolution, such as Ernst Jünger? Yeah. Um, initially, uh, it seems that Evola was, was very keen on the thinkers of the conservative revolution. And there's a guy, uh, Hans Thomas Hackel, who has written quite a lot about this. Um, I think events took over from this, because as we know, once the Nazis took power, they weren't very keen on the conservative revolution, and some of the people, and I can't quite remember the name now, but there was a guy who Evola had, had been in contact with in those circles, who if I remember correctly, the Nazis arrested him and killed him or something like that. So. So in Evola's relations with, with the Germans, we have two periods. We have a period when, when before Hitler comes to power, when Evola is, is cooperating quite actively with these guys, and then Hitler comes to power, and, and, and there's, uh, there aren't many relations between Evola and Germany, and then afterwards, towards the end of the, once he gets involved in, 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 in racial questions, then he goes back to Germany, and, and deals with the Nazis, because they're the ones in power, and he's been sent there by the Italian government. Um, yeah. Does that answer the question? I hope. Uh, was uh, Evola familiar with uh, Hans Hünter's uh, Rassology and the idea that uh, Roman spirit is actually Germanic spirit? And if he was uh, could be familiar, what would he answer to this? He would give two answers. First thing he would say, yes, exactly. That would be his first answer. His second answer would be that if we are dealing with human beings, we can't just use biology. Yeah? Uh, one, one, of, one of his most famous sayings is when he says in German, this is quite interesting, he says this in German, that Racial, biological racism is great for cats and racehorses. What about dogs? <laughs> but for human beings, you need something more complex. I think you probably include the dogs today. <laughs>
Uh, what, uh, what he uh, think about uh, 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 about uh, Indian philosophy, about uh, smartism, about addition karachari, about uh, this hard philosophy, about the, uh, uh, the person, the human, the person is uh, uh, have a connection with uh, with big person, a paramatman. What he I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, what what both of them, what Kino is doing and 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 Evgur is doing as well, is they they are taking what they find useful from 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 systems more than trying to do a a general critique of that system, right? So I, I, I haven't seen, you know, I, I haven't read every word, right? or I don't remember every word, I haven't seen that discussion, and that may be because he's taking what he finds useful and leaving what doesn't really help. <coughs> or perhaps the discussion's there and I haven't found it. Maybe one of the final questions for understanding East and West action and contemplation. Yeah, you know, and uh, Evola. Uh, Evola is considered a too oriental uh, thinker, in particular among the fascists. And, but uh, on the, again, the background of Enon, he is almost Western centric. Yes. And uh, his response to the modern world was first revolt, then, even when he developed his concept of authority, it was all the same right in the future. <coughs> Yes. And it seems that Genon's uh, uh, only response to this crisis was uh, disinvolvement and uh, contemplation and waiting. Or maybe it's not so. Did he believe that his uh, uh, traditionalism, colonial philosophy, uh, somehow helped it restrain okay. right. that, That's the quote that I skipped over because it was too difficult to translate and I thought we were running out of time. Genon uh, does actually address your question. And what he says is, Basically, Genot is not really interested in the daily day to day politics. Fine, that's okay. There's this one really good quote, which is the one that I had up here, where he says something along the lines of if you change the spiritual, that will then change everything else, including even the social, he says. Right. So, his, I mean, his, his, his idea about, Gino's idea about politics is, we're getting the end of the cycle, right? And the West is finished, right? because we're at the end of the cycle. What can happen now? He raises three possibilities for what can happen now. Either that's that, finished and Western civilization collapses into total chaos, bye bye. <coughs> Second possibility, Western civilization is taken over by Oriental civilization. Third possibility, Western civilization somehow manages to find an alternative approach itself For either of these two possibilities, we have to have our intellectual elite, which has to draw on what wisdom we can find. If Western civilization is going to be taken over by non-Western civilization, somebody has to talk to them. We need the interpreters. Right? Um, or alternatively, if Western civilization can save itself, yeah, we need, the interpreters have, have got to tell people how to do it. So, that is what really matters. If civilization collapses into chaos, it's finished. If the proper spiritual basis can be found for the civilization to solve itself, that will, then everything else will sort itself out. Right? So, it's not so much, sometimes it looks like an attitude of saying, I don't care, yeah? let, 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 let's all sort itself out, I'm going back to read a book. Yeah? No, that isn't his attitude. His attitude is, 
he, he does care, he does care, but he thinks that it's that what is crucial is, is the spiritual, and then everything else follows from that. Thank you. It again explains the connection between the and the yeah, yeah. It's interesting that you miss you spotted the slide I'd missed out in my argument. <laughs> That's how we collected it anyway. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you for some very good questions and thank you for your attention. Dużo dziękuję za takie ładne pytanie za waszą uwagę. I'm also very grateful for your magnificent lecture and discussion. Thank you very much for honoring our club.